Who knew the disk intersect problem on Codility would actually become a craft project? The best way to see what's going on is to actually have items that you can hold and touch and put them on a line. I cut out these cardboard disks and put them on a piece of paper with a horizontal line representing our array of indices. Um, the downside is, is that you can't see through the cardboard. So I have to arrange them on the paper in a different way than what Codility is asking. Again, this is just for visual representation. If you hang tight, I will go through the digital display that you can actually see through the disks and put them on the line that Codility is asking for. This is just to show you and hopefully give a better understanding of what the problem is asking. Okay, are you ready to do this? Let's do this. All right, we know from the outset our number of disks is six and we are given an array of integers representing the radii of the disks. So here are my disks. We have a big boy here, which is a radius of five. And then we have one a little bit smaller. That's a radius of four. And then we have a little one that's a two. And then two even littler ones, which is a radius, radii, a radius of one. And then a tiny one with a radius of zero. So we have our line starting at zero. All the center points of the disks are gonna go on the zero. So we're gonna take our biggest one and we're gonna set it right on the zero. And then we're gonna take our next one, our smaller one, and we're gonna set it on the line where it belongs. And this will make more sense when we look at this digitally. Put our smaller one on top. Our little one is going to actually go over, oops, over the smaller one. Another radius of one. I couldn't remember if it actually overlaps or not when I did this, but I'm putting it right on top there. And then we're going to take our little baby and we're going to put it right there. Now that we have all our disks on the line, the best way to see this, and this is going to be a little tricky, but is to actually pick it all up. You should do this yourself. It's actually pretty enlightening. We're going to pick it up, and you're going to see that the levels of the disks. And when they're on the line and turned, oh boy, there we go. That I knew that wasn't going to go right. Ah, just, ah, you can see what I'm talking about. All right, let's move to the digital part of this. Assuming that you understand in our array, I didn't put the indices. So for obviously one, five, two, one, four, zero, our index position of one is zero, our index position of five is one, two, three, four, five. So I, I should have wrote that on there, but I didn't. I'm just going to assume you know when I talk about this particular in integer, what the index position it is at. So let's begin. I did these translucent colored circles to indicate the integers. Remember, the numbers in the array indicate the radii of the circles. So for index position 0, we have a 1. That means that our circle here, the blue one, has a radius of 1. And remember, 1 is only half of the diameter of the circle. And our circle with a radius of 1 is at the 0 position on the line. Our next number, 5, is our big boy, which has a radius of 5. And it is on our first position on the line because it is at index 1. Our next number is 2. Our radius of 2 is actually on the second index position. Our next one is our blue one, which again is the same color as the one. I kept the colors color coordinated. So here's our radius of one at our third index position here. And our second big boy, which is four, is actually, once again, coincidentally, at index position four. And our last little guy of a radius of zero, he's just sitting there 
at our fifth index position at the end of our array. Here we're looking at a side representation of like our cardboard cutouts. Here's that digital thing that I was talking about. If you look at the cardboard cutouts that I picked up and actually fumbled, this is kind of what it would look like digitally speaking. So at index zero, I actually put little black dots in between the bars so you can see the radius of the disks. And this is how we're gonna count our intersections. So at index zero, we cannot count the disk before it. So it does not get included in our intersection count. So the best way that I can explain this is to count between the bars it actually looks like a capitalized I, is to count between the bars where the disks actually intersect and subtract one. So for index zero, we have two bars in between the brackets. We subtract one, so that's one. For index one, we put our I, our big I, in between the actual intersecting disks, which is three. We subtract one, becomes two. When we move over, to, move over to index two, we do the same thing because there is actually three disks together. Subtract one becomes two. Move over to index three. In between our brackets are actually four bars, but we need to subtract the one so it becomes three. Move over to index four, and we only actually have two bars that are together so we subtract one there it becomes one and in our last index of five we have three bars in the brackets we subtract one that becomes two hey there if you made it this far and enjoy what you're seeing, why not subscribe? I upload fresh content all the time. Thanks for watching. Remember this image? Let's change it to our line. On our range of indices, our first disk is turned into a line that is the same diameter of our disk. Negative one to positive one. We need to keep track of these two numbers, so we need to create two lists to store our information into, our starting point and our ending point. This is done by two operations, taking our index position of zero and subtracting our radius, and then taking our index position and adding our radius. We do this through our entire array like this. What we're doing is counting our endpoints that are less than our start points. How many starts are less than our end? As you can see on our first loop, there are four numbers less than one. And since we can't count itself, we subtract one to get three. For demonstration purposes, I put a counting box on the slides to store our counts. On our second loop, we have a six. All six numbers are not less than six, so we just subtract one and add our five. Our next two loops are, the, are for the same number four, and there are five numbers in our list that are less than four, so we subtract one from five and we get our two counts of four and four. On our fifth loop, we have an eight. All our starts are less than eight, so our count is six. Subtract one, put our five in our count. Finally, in our last loop, our end point is a five and all the numbers are less than or equal to five so we have another six subtracting one for another count of five. Now that we have our count, all we need to do is subtract off our indices and then calculate the sum. For further explanation, I created this spreadsheet here to hopefully shed a little light on what I just explained. We get our start points and end points from adding and subtracting our radii from our indices. Then we calculate our number of starts less than our ends. Subtract one from each count and then subtract our indices with a final action toward calculating the sum.
Before I start, let me add a little side note that this is in the sorting section for a reason. I didn't include the sort in my previous slides in the hopes of just helping you understand the mechanics of the problem itself. Now that we're at the testing part of this lesson, and since I've written my code using the bisect write function, in order for it to work correctly, our start points need to be sorted. For time purposes, I'm just copying and pasting my code into the window. I'll spare you the long, drawn-out purpose of watching me type. I hashtagged out what each line produces. Feel free to pause the video and compare it to the spreadsheet that I created a few seconds ago. The only difference you'll see again is that the start points are sorted in the code. I copied and pasted my code. You can see my hashtagged comments. We're getting the right answer. We will submit. Yes. We will continue. And we got an 87%. That's actually really good. I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Let's see what went wrong. Uh, oh, I see exactly what happened. I did not put the if statement. If the pairs are greater than 10 million, return negative one. That's my problem. Overall, I am very happy with the 87%. Once I added that if statement, I then got 100%. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video was helpful to you. Daily videos throughout the week are coming out, so don't forget to subscribe.